All right, hello and welcome, or welcome back to lesson three, Last Epoch University. This one's on loot, also known as gear. Very exciting topic. This is where you find stuff on the ground that's awesome and that you can put on and makes your character more powerful, all that great stuff. Okay, so let's uh, go ahead and get right into it. So we have um, a number of things to cover about it, including what's on the screen now, gear slots, you know, where items go, where, where you can put items, what type of items, also rarity, and also what's on the items. But we'll start, of course, with gear slots. This is how many places you have to put items on your character. And you have a helmet, an amulet, body armor, you have rings, two of them, you have a belt, you have gloves, boots, a relic slot, which is for every character, not just magic users, weapons, or weapons, um, and offhand. Uh, offhand can be a weapon as well. So you can have you know two dual wielding. You can have one two-hander, or you can have a one-hander and an offhand. Offhand can be a shield. It can be a quiver if you're using a bow, or it can be a catalyst, which is generally for magic users. The other thing you have for gear slots is idle slots and blessings, which we'll cover those soon. Blessings a little bit later. Um, they're both pretty cool gear slots that are Pretty unusual in the genre. As we'll talk about idle slots are fairly similar to D2 charms, but um, blessings are pretty pretty unique. Let's start, though, with the other stuff. So base types here is um, talking about all of the other slots, the helmet through the offhand. So base types are where you start with the item. Every item has a base. This is determines what type of item it is, gloves, boots, etc. So I guess in that regard, idols technically are, have a base as well as you blessings but what sets them apart from those is they also have an implicit stat or stats so for example if we look at um this item here it has armor increased cooldown recovery speed and increased stun chance at the top and then it's got those four other stats at the bottom the implicits are the top stats the armor increased cooldown recovery speed increased stun chance on this item, the Gorgon Scale Coif, it will always be those three stats, but the roll ranges can be different. You can actually alt and see what the roll ranges are. So the armor on this one is always the same, but the cooldown recovery speeds from five to 12%, and the stun chance is from 12 to 56%. We look at a bone amulet. It's got physical resistance and necrotic resistance. It will always be fizz and necrotic resistance on there, and it has stat roll ranges on both of those from 13% to 40%, and those are independent of each other. You can see 20% fizz on this one, and 39% almost perfect necrotic. Um, every amulet will have different implicit, so a bony amulet will be different from a silver amulet, for example. So that will also be true for weapons, for every every gear slot that goes into this section. The idols and the blessings were, are different. Okay, so they all have implicits. Those implicits are always the same for the same item. So Gor Gorgon Scale Coif Helmet will always have the same ones, but a different helmet will have different ones. Now, they have roll ranges, not every single implicit, but many of them do. Um, better bases with better implicits tend to drop at higher area levels and require higher character levels to equip. So early on, you'll see some bases with pretty, pretty menial stats generally. There are definitely exceptions, but generally. And then later, you'll see some really powerful stuff start to show up as far as bases with implicits. A helmet, body armor, and relics are class-specific base types, and they are the only ones. There are some minor exceptions for relics. There's like, I think, three relics that all classes can wear, but other than that, every other relic and every body armor and helmet is specific to the class. So rogues will have rogue-specific helmets and rogue-specific body armor and rogue-specific relics, uh, and primalists will have a different set. Everything else is universal. So, for example, this Gorgon Scale Coif is a rogue-specific helmet. Primalist has different helmets. It could never wear this. Um, but this ring here, the uh, ivory ring with the necrotic resistance and more attention, this is universal. Every character can wear this. Every class can wear this. There are another exception we should probably mention here, which is unique items. So, Exsanguinous is a unique body armor. Because it is unique... It actually can be worn by all classes, but the non-unique items are class-specific in the chest, helmet, and more or less in the 
relic slots. And every other one, again, there are weapons that certain classes can't use, but that's specific to that class. Otherwise, they would be generic. So otherwise, every class can can use axes. I think actually bows are the only one that um, only one class can wear. I think all the rest of them are universal. Okay. Moving on to the not not instead of the implicits, let's go look at the other affixes that are on it. So we saw the implicits on the Gorgon scale coif, but we also have these four down below. Those are um, considered affixes, unlike implicits. And you have two prefixes or up to two prefixes and two suffixes. So this item here has two prefixes. Those are the top ones. Physical penetration with shadow daggers and vitality and two suffixes, void resistance, endurance threshold. And you can tell if they are uh, prefixes or suffixes by both their placement on the item. So the prefixes are at the top, suffixes are on the bottom, but also there's a little, you can, if you can see it, there's a little um, arrow thing pointing on the prefixes. It points from the left to the right. And on the suffixes, it points from the right to the left. Okay, so yeah, they can all have four affixes, two previous two, two suffixes, and they're also craftable. Um, you can also add a fifth through crafting. We're not going to talk about that right now. We'll talk about that in the crafting sec uh, section. It's a fair, it's a pretty special thing that you can do, and it's more late game. So we'll definitely talk about it in the university series, but not here. Okay, prefixes are also usually offensive and utility stats, and suffixes tend to be defensive. So on prefixes, you'll often see things like critical strike chance, um, increased damage, added damage. Um, also primary attributes are up there. So dexterity, strength, vitality, which is a kind of a weird one because it's technically defensive, but it's a primary stat. So it goes up there. But usually it's going to be offensive or utility um, area, like increased area, prefix. Suffixes, defensive, health, resistances, armor, dodge rating, etc. That's usually holds on non-unique items. Unique items are totally different than this. We'll talk about those later. Uh, affixes have predefined gear slots. So some fit in many others, only one. For example, let's go back to our Gorgon scale coif. The fizz penetration with shadow daggers cannot go on most gear items. It can go on um, body armor and helmet technically there's one on idols too but that's a different thing as far as this gear here it can go on body armor and and helmet it cannot go on an amulet it cannot go on a ring cannot go on boots etc however um let's get void resistance can go on everything but weapons i believe yeah everything but weapons so some of them have you know broad usage cases other ones are very specific you'll be hunting them on very specific items um you won't have much flexibility where you get them okay um yeah as we mentioned here body armor helmet and relics prefixes include class actually it's perfect because we're just showing one so this is also a class specific affix this purple one it's purple because it's exalted by the way i didn't mention that we will talk about exalted very soon um so physical penetration with shadow daggers is a class specific rogue only so you will not see it on primalist helmets or primalist body armor or mage etc you'll only ever see it on rogue so it also along with only going helmet and body armor so yeah just point being different affixes have different restrictions now still on the affixes let's talk about tiers so you can upgrade or find better versions of each affix on gear. It can roll higher, it can roll higher tiers or lower tiers, or it can be crafted higher tiers. So the tiers go from one to seven, with seven being the best. So seven's the best rolls you're going to get. One are the worst rolls you're going to get. So if you find a tier one of health, it's going to have a pretty low roll. If you find a tier seven, it's going to have a very high roll. Most gear will only roll up to five tiers on any affix, but they can roll a tier six or seven, which makes an exalted item, which is what this fizz pen with shadow daggers is. It's, it's a tier six versus the others. You have three tier fives on there. So that's why that one's purple and the other ones are white. And we'll talk about exalteds more in a little bit. For non-exalteds, the two prefixes and two suffix means you can have a maximum of 20 total tiers on any item. Tier five times four fixes. So if you don't have an exalted item, the best you could do with it through crafting or through its own dropping is tier 20 not including that special crafting thing where you can create an additional um, affix, just baseline 
tier 20 is as high as you can go. That uh, that maximum to 24 thing is that special crafting thing. That's um, that's a note on here. All right, let's talk about rarities. So each item can be a different rarity. In fact, you probably noticed that these are different colors. This one's purple. This one's yellow. These ones are. This one's orange. Um, do I have a red one? Yeah, this one's red. It's probably kind of hard to see. They don't see the orange and the red except for the little tail on this on each side. But uh, there's different rarities on different items. So what makes them those different rarities? So for craftable gear, this is stuff that you can actually use the crafting system on. By the way, if you want to see what the crafting system is, is just press F and it's the forge. That's the crafting system. The things that can go in here and do things. So I could, like if I put, uh, if I have anything in here that I could actually technically. Yeah, so I put this in here and it will actually do things and I can you know, try to modify the gear. Uh, those have... Uh, technically five rarities right now. There's white. White just means there's no affixes on it whatsoever. So it's got just the it's just the item with the implicit. There's nothing else on it. No prefixes, no suffixes. Blues have one to two affixes on it. Can be prefix, can be suffix, doesn't matter. Yellows have three to four affixes on it. And purple, aka exalted, have at least one tier six to seven affix. Light blue is a new one that was added just last patch. And that has an experimental effect on it. I actually can show you what one of these looks like. So this one here, you notice it's got these this weird um, like blue and purple on it. Like it's, uh, half it's blue, half it's purple. And then if we hover over it, we get this uh, this blue effect on it. 15% of current health loss per second. 15% missing health gain is ward per second. If you see it on the ground, I don't think my loot filter will affect this. Let's see. It doesn't. Um, you can see it's got that blue look to it, uh, which is different than everything else in the game. And even though it's got technically an exalted on it, because that blue one is also exalted, it's still blue. Blue is like precedent. So, and it shows that there's exalted though through the, like when you pick it up, you can see the purple and the blue. The, the half purple here means it's exalted, and then the blue means it's experimental. Okay. There's also uniques and legendaries, which I'm wearing those as well. Uniques are orange and legendaries are red. We'll talk about those in a second. Those are your options. White, blue, yellow, purple, light blue, uniques, orange, and legendaries red. And that's all the, uh, the rarities currently in the game. Okay, so let's talk about each one specifically. What are the aspects of those? So white, blue, and yellow can drop from level one or very close to it. So you can start very early in the game and find a, find a yellow item. Of course, you can find a blue and a white as well. You won't find an exalted. Uh, you technically can find a unique, and we'll talk about that in a minute too. But these ones can drop very early. Uh, all the empty affix slots can be crafted up to tier 5. So, if, for example, if you find an item that's got only one affix on it, you can craft on the other three slots. They're open. So, you, if let's say it's got one prefix, that means you have one prefix and two suffixes that you can craft on whatever you'd like to craft on. It's going to cost you, of course, with a crafting system, but you can do that. Uh, the likelihood of an item dropping with higher tiers, i.e. Uh, like a tier 5 versus a tier 1, increases with area level and item rarity percentage, which is an in-game mechanic. So area level, which means the the higher level the monsters are in the area that you're in, not your character level, will increase the likelihood that you'll get items with higher higher tiers, which of course you want that. You want higher tier items. Um, an item rarity percentage, which was an in-game mechanic we'll talk about more in the end-game system, and a little bit here at the end. Crafting can also change the rarity. So remember that the rarity is determined at least from um, white through yellow is determined by how many affixes you have. So if you add an affix and you bump it into the next rarity, it will actually change the rarity item. So if you already have an item with two affixes, which would be blue, and you add a third affix onto it, it, it becomes yellow. All right, Exalted, which has its own little unique sort of rule set. It's mostly like the white, blue, yellow items, but does have the tier six and seven that cannot be crafted and can only be found. So um, you will never be able to craft an item from a tier five to a tier, tier six and from a tier six to a tier seven, at least in the current state of the game. These must be acquired through drops. But anything else on that item you can craft. So if you have only one exalted, well, for example, this one, I have this increased health that dropped. It dropped with increased health. And then I was able to craft up. You see, I have two tier fives here and then a tier one. I crafted two of those into a tier five. I don't believe either one started with that. And then I ran out of forging potential, which is what you need to craft. And so this is the state of the of the item. But I was able to craft on the items that were not 
or excuse me, on the affixes that were not the exalted. So same thing here. This is actually uh, tier six, tier five, tier five, tier four. That will be a tier five. I just ran out of item. Like my, my character level was too low to craft it higher at this point. Uh, this character is a fairly fresh character, but it will be a three tier five and a tier six. The tier six is what dropped, and then the rest I crafted up. Okay. Tier six and tier sevens have different drop uh, requirements as far as area level. So tier six can drop from area level 55 plus. This is late campaign um, starting uh, end game. And then tier sevens can drop from area level 90 plus, which is like arguably mid end game, something like that. So uh, you'll see tier sixes well before you'll see tier sevens. But then you'll start to see tier sevens once you get closer to empowered monolith and inside it. Uh, you can have multiple exalted affixes an item. So you can have like two tier sixes or a tier seven, tier six. Technically, you can have up to four tier sevens. But even getting two is rare. It definitely happens. It doesn't happen. It's not that unusual. I get I get them every every so often. But uh, the, the higher the up you go with that, the more rare it is. Like getting a tier seven, tier six is rarer than two tier sixes. And two tier sevens is rare. And then three is very, very rare. And then I've never seen a four. Um, exalted item. All right, let's talk about experimental. This is the new one that was added last patch. So experimental has an experimental fix on it. That's like the the gloves I showed with the um, the health lost and then ward gained. That is the experimental fix. Uh, it drops only from exiled mages. You'll see exiled mages uh, in the world. There'll be like a little marker on your map, and there's like this like prison, like like goldish kind of thing, look at prison thing. You click on it, and it, an exiled mage comes out, and then you. You attack the exiled mage, you kill it. He will always drop one experimental um, item, and so that's how you have to acquire those. They can be exalted as mine as mine is, or they can have another fix on it that's exalted or or multiple technically. So you can have an experimental exalted. That's no problem. Uh, the experimental fix does follow its own crafting rules. We won't get uh, really we won't really get into that here. But you cannot craft on an experimental fix the same way you'd craft on other affixes, even if it's like a low tier one. So this definitely restricts how you acquire and use these. Uh, and we'll talk about that a lot more in the crafting um, lesson. The experimental color does override any other colors, including Exalted, as I showed you on mine, when it comes to what's dropping on the ground. But then when you pick it up, you will see the multicolored when... Um, well, no matter what it has. So if it's like a, if it's a rare, it doesn't have any exalted on it, you'll see the blue and then the other half will be yellow. And then if it was um, only had two on it, you'd see the blue and then the other blue. Can't have a white, of course, because white has no fixes. All right, let's talk about uniques and legendaries next. We've gotten through all the stuff that's like traditional crafting things you can craft on. These um, uniques and legendaries follow a sort of different set of properties. So uniques are specific items similar to D4 and Peewee uniques. So if you think about Peewee or D4 uniques, they have uh, predetermined affixes on them, and they usually have something that's very special about them, an affix that's unusual that you wouldn't find anywhere else, maybe even multiple of those. Um, many of the affixes can have a role, uh, role range, even though they are predetermined. So let's look at some of the items we have here. So we have Exsanguinous. This is a very important item for low life builds. Uh, it has health loss per second and health gain is ward per second. Now we do have an affix that has these, right? We have this one. This is a brand new affix. It used to be the case that you could only find this on uniques. And there was two uniques that could have it. Well, three technically because there's two body armors. There's last steps of living, exsanguinous, and there's another body armor that could have it. But these are very important for these kinds of builds. And this is how uniques tend to work. They have special properties that are often very important for builds, either enabling or enhancing in some way. This also has a few other properties to it that are that are unique to it. Increased attack speed, cast speed, and movement speed. If you use a, a potion in the past four seconds. And immunity to bleed at low health. Let's look at another item here. Let's look at Smoke Weaver. Actually one of my favorite uniques in the game. So this has some pretty standard stuff on it. Melee physical damage, chance to blind a melee hit. Um, are pretty standard affixes. And you can definitely find those on other, um, melee, or, yeah, other melee weapons. However, dodge rating, while not an unusual affix, is very unusual to have on a weapon. In fact, I think this might be the only one that has added dodge rating. I think there's a few weapons. I think you actually craft increased dodge rating on a few, but that's a different stat. Reduced shift distance is a very specific thing, as, as is increased cooldown recovery speed for shift. This is very specific to the skill shift, 
which is a movement ability. So this allows you to move more often, but not as far with those um, those effects. And again, these will only be found on Smoke Weaver. The reduced shift distance, cooldown recovery speed, and, and the dodge rating are specific to it, and that's what makes it unique. Okay. Um, some of these items, these uniques, will drop off certain bosses. Others are random world drops. This is different than the other rarities where you can have target farmable items. For example, um, the Wings of Argentis only drops off of God Hunter Argentis. You can't get it anywhere else. So if you want to get those, you have to you have to fight him. However, Smoke Weaver can drop anywhere. So it's just a random world drop. There's ways to target farm it, but it's not a specific boss that you have to kill. Uh, not all uniques have the same drop rate. Some are far more rare than others. Um, some are far, far more rare. There are some that are extremely rare in the game. Not like so rare that you could never see them, but definitely a lot harder to get. And others you'll drop maybe it more often than you even like to because they're they're so common. Okay, legendaries are similar to uniques. In fact, start as uniques. So to get a legendary, you need a unique with legendary potential. And I do have one of those on right now. So for example, this Twisted Heart of Ukairos has one legendary potential. You can see it underneath the implicit increased health. So that is required to turn this into a legendary. It is not yet a legendary. I have not gone through the process of making a legendary. I haven't found the base I want for it, which we'll talk about in a second. But this can become a legendary, whereas this cannot. Exsanguinous doesn't have any legendary potential on it, so it can never become a legendary. If I find another one with legendary potential, then I can do it. But this particular Exsanguinous can never be a legendary. Okay, so to create a legendary, you need to have the unique with a legendary potential, but you also have to have an exalted item. An exalted item of the same type that also has four affixes already on it. Two prefixes, two suffixes. It has to be two prefixes, two suffixes. You can seal an affix on it in the crafting system. That's the thing we'll talk about later uh, during the crafting uh, section, but that won't count. You have to have two prefixes, two suffixes on it, and then you can slam it into a unique with legendary potential, and it will take at least one up to four of the affixes, the prefixes, suffixes, off of that exalted and destroy the exalted in the process. How many it takes depends on the number of legendary potential you have. So the Twisted Heart of Okyrus I have here is one legendary potential, which means it would take one affix off. Which one it takes is random. It does not have to take the exalted affix on an exalted item. It can take anything off of it. So of course, the more legendary potential you have, the better. Um, but Sometimes you have to take your chances because not everything has the same chance of getting high legendary potential. In fact, some items, it's basically impossible to get three and four legendary potential. Um, so there's a lot of play with like what you would actually try to do. And there's definitely a lot of um, luck involved in making legendaries. But if you get the right legendary, it is amazing. If you get the right affixes on the right legendary... Some of the most powerful items in the game. You create these in the Eternity Cache with the Temporal Sanctum Dungeon, which we'll talk about more in the end game. This is a dungeon that you go to once you get a key. Keys will drop in the world, usually in the end game. Um, and then once you kill the boss, you will be able to access the Eternity Cache, which is where you will then take your legendary with, or excuse me, your unique with legendary potential, and your exalted, and you'll slam them together, and you'll make your legendary. Okay. Moving on to idols. Idols are a fairly easy concept once you see it. They are similar to charms in Diablo 2, but they do have their own gear slot. So on our character, they show up over here. Here's the idol section. So you see I have all these different idols, these large idols here, these shadow idols, these stout Lagonian idols, and these humble Lateran idols, and these small Lagonian idols. And this area always looks the same. You have to unlock these slots to be able to access it. You do that through the campaign. Get rid of that stuff so I can do this more easily. And then you can slot these things in however you want to. So I can take these out and I can rearrange them. I can put this down here, I can put this over there. I can use different idols all together. Um, it's up to me. It's like playing Tetris. So there's, of course, going to be like a most optimal way of setting it up for, for most players. But um, different builds will do it differently. Different builds will look very different as far as where they, where they place their idols. Okay, uh, idols are random drops in the world, and they're not directly target farmable um, or craftable, although that's not necessarily as true if you play Circle of Fortune, the faction. 
Um, but that changes a lot of target farming. Anyway, if you play Circle of Fortune, you technically can target farm these. And I guess if you play Trade, Mar Merchant's Guild, you'll be able to just buy them. Um, but they are not craftable. There's nothing you can do to alter them in any way. Once you get them, that's what it is. Um, yeah, Blessings can also help you find idols, but the Circle of Fortune and Trade is probably going to be the best way to get these once, uh, once those release to 1.0, which should be very soon after the release of this video. Um, there is an exception to these items. There are two unique idols that are boss drops, so the target farmable part. There are two that you have to kill a certain boss to get. So that's just, you just go kill the boss and then hopefully it drops it. If it doesn't, do it again until it does. Um, the idol slots, as I mentioned, are open through quests that you do through the campaign. And slotting idols like playing Tetris. Um, as far as which idols you can use on your character, one by ones and one by twos are universal. Any character can use them. Well, all the others are class specific. One by three, three by one, one by four, four by one, and two by twos are all of the ones that are class specific. So in this scenario, this one here, the small Lagonian, the stout Lagonian, and the hum the humble Terran idol are all universal. The any class can wear these. However, these large shadow idols are rogue specific. Only my only the rogues can wear them. Blessings are another pretty cool addition to our itemization. We earn these through the Monolith of Fate, which is the endgame system that we'll talk about a lot more in the endgame lesson. Uh, each Monolith of Fate boss, which is uh, tied to the timelines, has their own blessing table. They have specific blessings that you can farm for. Um, and so you can target farm a boss to acquire a specific blessing. Let's uh, look at this visually a little bit. So how that works is this is the Monolith of Fate right here. You can see these islands. Each island is a timeline. And each timeline requires you to do some things to get to the point where you can fight the boss. Once you fight the boss, he will then drop a blessing. Or, excuse me, he will give you an option, some options for blessings. So you'll start with having three options, and then you can in increase the number that you get each time that you kill them. And then you can select the blessing that you like the most, and that becomes a permanent fixture on your character. And you can see that here in the blessing section. So you can see this character has um, increased unique drop rate from, from Fall of the Outcast. The Black Sun, it's got Void Resistance. Ending the Storm, it's got Mana. These are not optimal, by the way. This is a very early stage character um, as far as endgame goes. And then um, Reign of Dragons has plus 9 to all resistances. The Last Druin has increased, increased class-specific shard drop rate. Age of Winter has chance to shred physical resistance on hits. And then Spirits of Fire has armor. You can also probably have noticed that some of these are power. They increase your character's power. You should probably click on the ones that are. These are power ones. And then some of these are not. This one is... Increases your ability to farm uniques, and this one increases chance you'll find class of shard drop rates. Not not direct power increases to your character. Every blessing um, slot that can have power is only power. So this one will only drop power type blessings: endurance threshold, freeze rate, stack of chill, of course the shred, chance to chill on hit, spell cold while channeling, etc. And then the ones that uh, have non-power blessings will only ever have non-power. So you don't have to choose between whether or not you want to increase your farming efficiency or the, the power of your character. They are mutually exclusive. Okay. Is there anything we did not cover here? Oh, they have a roll range and higher quality blessings. Yeah, let's talk about that. So you can actually see it here visually as well. There's a roll range, and it's it's indicated by this uh, this blue circle that goes around it. If it's all the way, then it means you have the maximum roll. And, of course, this one here is very low roll. We can actually alt over to see the roll range. So this is 25 to 40%. I got 26. That's not very good. I would definitely want to increase this one or improve this one. But I'm going to want to do that anyway because there are normal blessings and then there are greater blessings. Um, and the... Is it called greater? I'm for some reason... I think, yeah, it's, it's got... We got more powerful ones from the empowered, um, the empowered uh, timelines. And so I'm going to want to replace this with the empowered timelines versions. I mean, they're not greater, they're grand. I don't know why I was brain farted there. The grand, the grand blessings are higher roll ranges of the same blessing. So I'm going to want to replace this with a grand void resistance, which is going to roll much higher. In fact, grand rolls all the way to 75%, so it could cap me on its own. Um, so that's going to be one of the chases you're going to have in endgame is to get the best blessings you can, get the you know get the high rolls in all of them, or even perfect them if you're if you're someone who wants to go that far, uh, and get them all, get all the ones that you that you need for your build. Okay. 
Uh, vendors and gambling. So this is a kind of a secondary topic, but we'll, we'll cover it real quickly here. So there are a few ways to buy some items outside of the Merchant's Guild, which is the, you know, the new faction for trading. There are just random vendors in the world, and they will update every 15 minutes with what they have to, to offer. The, the items are weighted toward level appropriate bases. So the higher level you are, the better the items tend to be. But they don't tend to be very good. Once you get far enough along, you're probably not going to really deal with it too much. But early on, it can be a really good source of gear. They do not sell uniques, exalteds, or idols ever. And you make the purchases with gold. There's also a gambler. The gambler is in the end of time in a few other places. They are also purchased with gold. He will display the base type, but not the implicit rolls or any affixes. You will then buy the item and then it will display it to you. It can be a white item. It can be a blue. It can be a yellow. It can never be an exalted. It can never be a unique. So the best you can get is a yellow. He only sells low level bases. Um, so it's useful for leveling, but not much past that. Usually around, I don't know, 40 to 60, we'll say somewhere around there. He becomes not very useful to you. Uh, you can re-roll his inventory for 500 gold um, or less at lower levels. So this becomes a way to um, target an item that you need uh, earlier on when the vendor just doesn't have it and you don't want to wait 15 minutes. So the gambler is quite useful for leveling. And there are two other types of gamblers in the game, or at least there will be. The Soulfire Bastion Dungeon, another endgame dungeon, does include an endgame focused gambling system that allows you to get um, exalteds and uniques. So that is an option for, for later if you want to if you want to keep gambling on items that actually could be worthwhile. Also, each faction that is coming at 1.0 has a gambler with base types that are faction specific. So you can only get these from the, the faction. Um, and they can they can uh, actually roll exalted. So these base types aren't expected to be super endgame items, but they kind of give you like a mid mid endgame uh gambler to work with to help it improve your gear if you want to go that route okay the last topic is item rarity and target farming so this we'll go into this more also in the end game thing but this is how do i improve my gear chase like how do i improve the, the ability to get good items item rarity is an end game mechanic that increases your chance to find higher tiers and more fixed and craftable items exalted items unique items crafting mats and keys so you're going to want to push item rarity in the end game. And again, go to the end game section if you want more information on this. And then we will cover it. And then if you want to target farm, there are actually certain uniques from end game bosses that you can do that from. There are specific rare exalted or unique types that you can get through Monolith of Fate rewards. So every echo you do, which is a map, can give you rewards. And then um, some of the timelines have very specific things that you can get from there. Like there's a timeline where you can actually get echo rewards for unique bows. So that's been somewhere that you could you could go for that. There's also a way to farm exalted items in the dungeons. We'll talk about that more in the end game as well. And then another way to try to get uniques is from a crafting material called the Rune of Ascension. The Rune of Ascension is a uh, material that you you put in with the item type of the unique that you want. So let's say that you're looking for a unique bow. You want Dragon Song, the Dragon Song bow, which is a pretty popular one, one that I, I like a lot. So you put a bow in there, any bow, doesn't matter what bow, and you put in the Rune of Ascension, and you will get a unique bow. It will always be a unique bow, and it can be anything from a level one required bow to the highest required bow. It doesn't matter what your character level is. You will, you can get any any of the bows from Rune of Ascension. And so, if you're looking for a particular bow and you're struggling to find it, and you have some Rune of Ascensions, that's a way that you can target farm for that item. The next thing, the big thing that's being added for 1.0 is, of course, factions. Factions are going to completely change the hunt for items in some pretty significant ways. So the Merchant's Guild is going to enable you to trade items. It's going to allow you to eventually trade everything, or almost everything, not crafting materials, but every every gear slot item can be traded. Idols can be traded. Uh, belts can be traded. Uniques can be traded. Legendaries can be traded. So, etc. Everything will be able to be traded. Well, I guess blessings won't be tradable. So everything but blessings. Um, and the Circle of Fortune will enable prophecies and other benefits that you'll be able to use to hunt for items. So prophecies are a way to like look for certain things by spending your um, your faction currency on it. And then of course the faction itself is going to have reputation. That'll give you um, it'll give you additional uh, ranks in it. And when you rank up, you'll get benefits like double the chance to get legendary potential on a unique. So there's a lot of ways in this game to try and get the things that you're looking for and to improve the opportunity to do so and to just juice um, the gear find. That's the overarching idea here that 
I want to purvey to you. So it, the game has a lot of opportunity there. Okay, that's everything for items. This was a longer one, but I think it was um, I think it was warranted. Um, I do stream on Twitch all the time, or a lot of the time, and especially once 1.0 comes out, it'll be all of the time. And we do have a Discord if you'd like to join us and ask questions and just join the community. So we'd love to have you there. I'll have those in the description below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this was helpful to you, beneficial. We'll have the next video out very soon. Uh, have a great time in Last Epoch, and uh, I'll see you all again real soon.